Holy Spirit, help us. This past week, I was able to spend a few moments in Spartanburg. I was grateful to have the opportunity to preach revival there. And the interesting thing is this is the best my voice has sounded all week long. And even though I could barely get above a whisper Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, God's Spirit met us there in Spartanburg. And so I was gracious and grateful every time that I have an opportunity to share the gospel. But there was another part of that trip that was very special to me as well. I got to spend some time with my college roommate, a person I looked up to when I sojourned and matriculated and made my way to the campus of Wake Forest University in the fall of 1997. My college roommate was named James Griffin. He actually was a 1997 South Carolina Player of the Year. And he came with all kind of accolades, and he was part of a star study recruiting class for Wake Forest University. Our coaches decided to put us together, and honestly, when we first met, I had issues with him because I was the shortest of that recruiting class, and they thought they could boss me around. So they made me sleep on the top bunk and made me all kind of problems, but I quickly let that go, and we forged a relationship. And so as we met this week, we had time to catch up. Uh, I was thankful because we began to reminisce of our college years. And I don't know about you, but my freshman year in college was by far one of the best years of my life. I know you probably never had that experience, but it's something to be the fresh face on campus, to be in a new place, and also to play basketball that kind of gave you a certain kind of air and certain kind of reputation, certain kind of ability to do a lot of things that you couldn't do while you were under the authority of your parents at home. And since we were at Wake Forest, which was a predominantly white school, we found out that there was more fun to be had at the neighboring school right down the street called Winston-Salem State University. So me and Grip, a couple of our teammates, we oftentimes would find ourselves on the campus, posted up on the yard, and we wanted to make sure that everyone knew we went to Wake Forest. We had on our jogging suits, Wake Forest hats, Wake Forest jackets, because we felt that if they knew we were Division I basketball players, it would make it easier for us to make the connections you want to make as a freshman in college. <laughs> so we would post up right outside the student union, right there in Winston-Salem State, and our full Wake Forest regalia. And I remember talking to my friend this week, and we remember one time, we just knew. We had a big win we just had as a team. We were all on the TV. And so we just knew this should be easy for us to make a connection because for once, we were Wake Forest basketball players. But I'll never forget, as we sat on the yard, we saw two co-eds walking our way, and surely we thought at that time, this should be easy. At least get a number, at least get some kind of information. So we just walked up to them with all of our Wake Forest regalia on, and we laughed this week because I remember poignantly one of the females saying simply, you ain't all that. <laughs> it busted our bubble because we just knew we were somebody based on what we had on, based on our ability to play basketball. But that was a stinging critique because it reminded us, and she did just in those few words, to let us know it's not about what you have on not about the talent that you have. There has to be something bigger, and don't think you're gonna get connected just because you play basketball, that you ain't all that. I wonder how many of us, if God was to meet us with all of our spiritual regalia on, you know how we show up to church with our Christian hats, crosses around our neck, big Bibles that we tote, <clears throat> got our Sunday go to meeting on. I wonder if God was to greet us what would God's response be to us? Because you know how we are. We think we are really all that. We think we got it going on. But I can imagine that our bubble will get busted just like me and Grip on that fateful day where God will literally look at us and say, you ain't all that. That's what our text seems to give us some context. As we share this word that we continue this sojourn through the book of Mark, it's intriguing to know that we're coming to perhaps a very crucial part of Mark because now we're getting to what is considered the last portion of the didactic section that Jesus shares during the week of Passover. After next week, we're getting to chapter 13, which is perhaps the hardest of the chapters to be exegeted, and 14, 15, and 16, which deal with the passion narrative, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of Jesus. But this text that we're 
encountering today is intriguing because we're seeing a reprieve of Jesus because he has spent some time on the defense of those who are trying to figure out who he is. And he's had the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, the Pharisees begin to attack him based on his authority, identity, his theology, and his priority. But I love Jesus because Jesus is one that always has to have the last word. And our text today gives us not a Jesus on the defensive, but it gives us a Jesus on the offensive. Because it's almost as if he has to leave those who are trying to identify and pinpoint who he is. He's trying to let them know that I see through your facade and you're not all that. He seems to suggest that those who've been coming at him, Jesus takes the time in our text to flip the script, to turn the tables, if you will, and say that you seem spiritual, but I've looked beyond who you claim to be and I know exactly who you are. It is in that particular passage in that vein that we begin to wrestle with the nuances and the real truth and tension of this text. Because Jesus' critique of the religious scholars can oftentimes make us examine ourselves. Because what we begin to hear out of this text is that Jesus perhaps is not as much interested how much word you know, but maybe he wants to know how much word do you live. In other words, this text today is not about trying to attack positions as much as it is attacking certain perspectives. And I wonder today, because that's really the theme that this text seems to grab towards us. Because let's be honest, all that Jesus is trying to get us and his disciples to do is to be worthy of the calling for which we have. And Jesus in our text begins to let us know that in order to, for us to suffice and be satisfactory when it comes to kingdom representation, is that we must understand that he is more interested in how we are examples of the word and not just expressors of the word. Hear me clearly today. Jesus flips the script because Jesus tells us, I'm more interested in your walk than your talk. Yeah. That's his passage, my brothers and sisters. And it causes all of us to examine ourselves, no matter what positions you may hold, no matter what titles you may have. Jesus lets us know that at the end of the day, when you operate in the kingdom of God, you can put all that aside because you know who you are and you're just glad to be favored by God. At the end of the day, you know that you're not known by your name and nomenclature. You are known by how you've submitted and sacrificed for the service of the kingdom of God. And I come to tell you at the end of the day, no matter where we stand, pulpit, pew, choir stand, or in the lobby, God wants you to know something. You're not all that. And when you realize you're not all that, that's a good place to give God praise because when you know how less you are, it gives him the opportunity to make you high and to promote you in the kingdom. That's all I came to tell somebody today, that at the end of the day, Jesus is not trying to judge you on your perception. Jesus wants to judge you on your performance. Jesus says, if you know my word, then you should be able to live that thing out. That's our text. And we begin to notice it and begin to just begin to, to deal with it in the context of this whole relevant question because then it has to be asked, what barriers, what things do we need to avoid? What behavioral adjustments do we need to be careful about when we're trying to get ourselves to be the disciples that Jesus wants us to be? There's three things I want you to highlight today. And he says that these issues, these areas are important for us to grow in. That be careful when it comes to conceit corruption and complacency these three things he warns not just the religious scholars but also us in our text are you ready to get this word today I hope that you're able to receive what he's saying because here in our text the first thing he tells us is that first of all be warned against conceit touch your neighbor say you can't be arrogant <laughs> our text is crucial because we see the offense of Jesus. And before I get into the body of the sermon, note that he's already given them a theological lesson in exegesis. Exegesis really just simply means how one interprets scripture. And there was a thing in that day, how can the Messiah be the son of David? 
That's why Jesus in verse 35 through verse 37 has to remind them that that's an oxymoron. That what you're thinking is being said cannot make sense determined on scripture. He quotes Psalm 110. Many of that day believe that each of the Psalms were penned by David. And Psalm 110 says, and my master sit at my right hand where I make your enemies my footstool. Here Jesus tells them, how can the son of David also be called the master of David? He begins to tell them that that cannot make sense. Therefore, the Messiah you're looking for is not in legacy or lineage. It's simply a son being the Lord. Here Jesus makes it clear that he's a supernatural leader of David and he's come not as some conquering Messiah, but to be the Messiah that shall give redemption to the world. Those that hear this particular understanding, they are happy and desirable because now Jesus is setting the stage for them to understand him in full context. But then he flips the script and then he turns his attention towards the religious scholars. And he said, you religious scholars walk around with your flowing robes. Uh, you talk about how you're greeted in the marketplace and you also discuss the special seatings you get at the banquet. Notice that he lifts up these religious scholars considered scribes. He is now taken away from those who are Sanhedrin, those who are the Sadducees, and those who are Pharisees. He now pinpoints the scribes. The scribes are those who have the ability to interpret scripture. Their job is to transcribe the words onto the Torah. Because of their literal understanding of the word, they are given this position. They are given this opportunity to ingratiate themselves and integrate the word of God. Because they are writing down the word of God, they should know what the word of God means they've been trained from youth and so they have an important position in the temple because they don't have little Bibles like what we have they would have the scrolls that they would unfurl these scribes job was to translate and to write down these words not just from the Torah but also from the various rabbis and here Jesus says don't get it twisted I know you got an important position you have become translators of the word but I'm not liking how big your head has gotten. Uh, you somehow have taken your position and you've allowed it to come to a place where now it's predicating on your status. He talks about in those three terms, a flowing robe. He talks about how you get met in the marketplace and he talks about your seats at the banquet. Look at these flowing robes that some of these scribes would wear. But Jesus makes it clear that I'm not saying you can't wear these priestly garments, but yet they were supposed to only be utilized during festive and ceremonial occasions. What he's suggesting in our text is that these scribes would always wear these robes because they felt like wearing these robes would allow them to look pious and righteous. Even when they were not operating in their assignment in the temple, they would put on these religious garments to make themselves stand out in front of the people. In other words, Jesus says, first of all, you got it twisted because you should only be wearing that when you're operating under the favor or the assignment of God but you're wearing these robes to get other people's attention because you want them to see your outer instead of seeing your inner in other words he said I want you to understand that you're not doing a good thing towards God you're doing something to promote yourself and so you'll put on that clerical collar you'll put on all that religious robe because you want people to think you're more pious than what you are he said come on learn how to be common sometimes because what you have on does not speak about the life that you live because you can have on a nice fancy garment and still have a crooked and contrite heart. He says, I need you to be at a place where you recognize it's not about the clothes you have on the outside, but it's about the heart that you have on the inside. And I know there's some of us, you know how we are. We get so entitled. We wear what we want to wear to make other people think we are special. I've learned something that you can wear clothes. You can try to look holy, but it's not about how you look. It's about what your heart seems to say. That's why some of us miss it. 
That's why some of us can't wait till we get some clerical kind of con some clothes because we think that makes us. Listen, it's not the clothes that make you. Uh, you ought to make the clothes. And if the truth be told, you can put on a policeman outfit. That don't make you police. You can put on a judge robe. That don't make you a judge. So putting on a priestly garment don't make you more saved and spiritual than anybody else. I wish I had a few people that can help the preacher now. Touch your neighbor says, show you right. I feel that right there. So don't get it twisted. It's not about what you have on the outside. He said it's what you have on the inside. That's what I heard a lot of times. I get a lot of different critiques, and I've become numb to them now, Deacon Hunter. I get them all the time. And one of the critiques I used to get is because people used to have a problem that I didn't wear robes. It's not as if I don't have a problem with robes. Number one, they can be real hot, and these lights are hot, and y'all see I sweat anyway. But number two, I never thought a robe should be something to make me be somebody that I already am. That I shouldn't have to put on a garment to make you see me as as a priest matter of fact I just want to be comfortable because at the end of the day it's not about the robe I wear it's about the God I serve I dare you if you don't mind touch that neighbor beside you and say get over it get over it get over it learn how to just be you he said you wearing these flowing robes as if to set yourself apart not only to say these rooms, but he talked about how they got greeted in the marketplace. Now, this is where it's kind of interesting in how Jesus takes some liberty in his interpretation because these scribes had they had this understanding of the word of God, the Torah. And so according to the Jewish Talmud, it suggested that when people saw you and knew how high you were in the word, it was their obligation to speak to you and you didn't have to speak to them. Uh, it kind of caused a friction or faction to happen and they would literally come up to you because they knew your station and so they would have to by permission or by right call you based on your title. So they would come up to you say rabbi so and so or master so and so. That's how they they greeted you uh, in the marketplace. And note what Jesus says. He said, listen, I'm not saying that that's not right and protocol, but at what point are you at a place where, first of all, you should be humble enough to talk to people on your own, and secondly, you should also be at the place where you don't have to be known by the titles you hold. Uh, we know you a rabbi. We shouldn't have to call you one. We know that you operate in this position. We shouldn't have to call you one. And I know y'all probably don't deal with it, but your pastor does. I meet so many people that I get handed so many cards and you would think that their first name is Bishop their first name is Apostle their first name is Reverend Doctor at the end of the day baby I'm glad you got a title but at the end of the day your title don't make you who you are can we get to the place where we can just be common from time to time I'm not saying you didn't own it I'm not saying you didn't work for it but I thank God that comes a place that even if nobody acknowledges your title you don't need somebody to acknowledge what you already should be secure in yourself to have already. That's why I don't trip when people don't call me pastor or reverend doctor or I know what I've worked hard for. I know the degrees I have on my wall. So whether you acknowledge it or not, it doesn't mean much to me because at least I'm secure in me that you ain't got to call it as long as I operate in it. Touch somebody and tell them, come on, be common sometime. Stop thinking just because you got a title that that's what you need to get. That's why some of us, we struggle in leadership putting people in leadership because as soon as you get a title you let the title go to your head before you were serving and doing work now you deacon so and so you too big for everybody you trustee so and so now you think you know everything now you so and so now sit down sometimes it's not about the title you have it's what you can add to the title and at the end of the day none of us should be predicated on our title because when we get to heaven he's not going to say well done good and faithful bishop he's not gonna say well done good and faithful deacon he's not gonna say well done good and faithful apostle he's simply gonna say well done good and faithful servant so if you want a title that bad then maybe your title ought to be servant touch your neighbor said neighbor that's the kind of title I want just call me servant because if there's anything that needs to be done I'll do it in the kingdom of God so you got the big head cause your robes flowing you got too much about your name <coughs> but also he says notice how you get special seats at the banquet now understand these religious scholars because of their position 
would have special seating and priority at the banquets. Now, these special seats were important, uh, and it was really just because of their position. They could sit to the left and right of the host. Because of these special seats, it gave them honor and prestige. And Jesus saying, listen, I'm not tripping you got the seats. I'm tripping because you feel you've earned the seats. I'm not mad you get to sit up front. I'm mad because you feel like you deserve to be up front. And it causes us to really examine ourselves and how we began to understand God's favor in our lives. Be clear, none of us deserve any of the seats or places you're in. Oh, come on, let's be honest. I know you saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. I know that you speak in tongues every day. I know that you walk in water. I know that you got all that. But let's be honest. The places of favor, the spots that God give us, don't none of us deserve. Come on, let's be honest. Don't none of us deserve to be in church. Don't none of us deserve to sit where we sit. But God in his faithfulness and favor decided to give us something we don't deserve. That's why you don't trip if you don't get to sit at the front table. You just happy to be in the room. There's some of y'all in here. You just happy to be in the room. You ain't tripping. Ain't nobody got to have your name on a play card. Ain't nobody got to bring you no tea and no roll. You just happy to, if you got to stand as long as you're in the room. Because when you know who you are, you just say, Lord, I thank you because I don't deserve to. Come on, that's why I get a little upset with some people who feel like you are old or entitled some kind of position. Come on, let's be real. Don't none of us deserve none of the grace and favor and mercy of God. Our sins should have called us to be exterminated last night, but God in his faithfulness woke us up this morning. So before you start thinking you all that, just remember he didn't have to wake you up this morning. And I want you to get to the place where you're not feeling a just because you got a nice car and a nice house and a few people stand when you enter the room, baby, it ain't about that. Because at the end of the day, we don't deserve none of the stuff that God has given us. When was the last time you just said, Lord, thank you for your favor? I shouldn't have my job. Thank you for your favor. I shouldn't have what I have. Thank you for your favor. I should be ridiculed and an outcast, but thank you for your favor. I don't deserve nothing. So that's why I ain't got time to have a big head. I ain't got time to look down at people because I know for my Myself, uh, that if it had not been well y'all might as well help me preach this is my last one touch somebody with your elbow and say neighbor I'm just happy to be here don't, don't get it twisted when I think I uh, look back over my life I don't deserve the good car I don't deserve the house I done did some jacked up stuff uh, and I'm going to do some more jacked up stuff but yet in still uh, God's favor still follows me uh, touch your neighbor and say neighbor you might as well get on this favor train while you can uh, I ain't got the best degrees but I got favor I may not have the best voice but I got favor I may not have all the degrees you got but I got favor and when you got favor you want to humble yourself and say I'm just glad to be you said listen warning against conceit but then he says also because I don't want you being arrogant and Dean John Kenny says God can never anoint arrogance and some of y'all ain't gonna like what I'm gonna say but I'm gonna give it to you anyway because I'm your pastor and I love you <laughs> Some of y'all won't receive the crown because your head too big. Preach, Pastor Goodman. I'm doing the best I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm telling you, I, I ain't got time. Let me move on. I don't have time. Listen. Warning against conceit. But then secondly says warning against corruption. <laughs> Notice how he says in his text that he kind of talks about their heart and their actions. And he lifts up what may seem to be two totally divergent kind of ideas. Long prayers and deceiving widows. Now understand, the religious scholars of that day were not employed by the temple. And for that reason, they could live off the benevolence of those they helped. And you understand the temple had these requirements that you were supposed to help the orphans, the widows, the less fortunate. That was always a responsibility of the religious. That God gave you privilege to be a blessing to someone else. But the problem in our text is that the religious scholars, instead of embracing the benevolence from those who were less than, they decided to cheat them. 
to, to somehow use their funds and not give them the desired work that they needed. And so because these widows who were literally uncovered women, they literally had no one to speak their case even when they had been done wrong. And so here is on one hand, these religious scholars who should have known better who should have knew their responsibility was to help those who were less than and who were weaker than them. But they were more focused on long prayers or being verbose in their address because they wanted people to think they were spiritual based on what they said instead of what they did. So they would sit up there and in that day, they believed that the longer you prayed, the more holy or righteous you were. So people would just stand and start to make a mockery of God's house because their prayers weren't meant to impress God, it was meant to impress people. So they would just sit there and just start bellowing out these long prayers. And so people, because we judge things on our eyes, assume because they could say things in a way that sounded good, that they had to be spiritual. But on the other hand, no matter what they said, they still were taking advantage of those who they were called to reach. And I want you to know something. Some of you are saying, well, Pastor, why? how could that be applicable to us today? Well, what it says is we have to be careful in what we project, project as our spiritual understanding because what we project may fool people, but it will never fool God. That God is not just interested in what you say. He's also interested in how your heart engages your righteous responsibility to help somebody else. Y'all do know that Jesus had a problem with this because he gave a parable in one of the gospels where he said that there was this publican and there was this uh, Pharisee. And this Pharisee had come and he waited in front of all the people. They were all there. And so he stood up in front of the people, hands outstretched, and began to talk to God. Or so thought he was talking to God. And saying, God, I just thank you for making me who I am. I thank you for not allowing me to be a sinner like the rest of the people and I thank you for allow how you allow me to be better off than those who you've called in this place and he thought that his prayer was making its effort to God but this publican didn't stand in public he matter of fact found himself a little crack or place where he could go all by himself and he didn't even stand with his hands raised which was the proper posture of prayer he got on his face and he didn't have anything much to say he could not pronounce things the way the Pharisees did but he simply said Lord have mercy on me and Jesus said whose prayer do you think God heard was it the verbose Pharisee that was just praying to impress people or do you think it was that little sinner publican who didn't mind getting on his face didn't have much to say but all he could say was Lord have mercy. See, that's why I want to tell you sometimes you ain't got to be deep to get God's attention. You ain't got to sit there and say thee and thou and try to get all these words together. I, I've learned that some of my most effective prayers have not been long ones in a microphone, but it's been those quick prayers where I say, God, I need you. Or Lord, have mercy. Is there anybody beside the preacher that say every now and again, you ain't got to hear none of my prayers. Because at the end of the day, I'm not trying to get you impressed anyhow but I need the Lord to work on my behalf and I want to have such a prayer life that God can honor it because he knows I'm not just trying to talk to him to impress him but I'm trying to talk to him because I want to be better there ought to be somebody here that that's the reason you give God everything because you want your heart to get it right you want the life that you live to give honor and glory to God so you ain't trying to impress people they don't have to let you get on the mic any Sunday you don't have to be able to say nothing at prayer meeting at all because you can get in your own little prayer closet and have a little talk with Jesus because when you talk with Jesus if my grandma was here she'd say then I learned that everything will be all right touch that neighbor said neighbor I'm thankful that I serve a God that he hears every little prayer I have and sometimes it's not a long one but it's simply saying Lord help Lord I need you and sometimes I don't even know what to say I just say 
I wish I had somebody. Because scripture says he even takes the unintelligible little moanings and groanings that you have. And the Holy Spirit takes it and sends it to the Father. So touch a neighbor and say, neighbor, even when I don't make sense, he still understands it. Even when it don't even have to be loud, he still understands it. Said one and against conceit, one and against corruption. He says, Don't be so busy trying to flaunt your spirituality that you fail to do the prerequisite things that make your righteous relationship worth it. Like, don't put all these scriptures on Facebook and then you're the hell you're at work. Don't. Don't be tweeting all this inspirational articles and you're the main gossiper on your neighborhood. No. Because the Bible says, how can blessings and curses come out of the same place? He says, you incongruent. You need to work on that because you're too busy impressing people that you're not impressing God. Notice, warning against conceit. Warning against corruption. And then here's the final thing. Warning against complacency. Because <laughs> Jesus concludes it by after talking about all that by simply saying, but they will pay for it in the end. This is tough. This ain't what you want to hear, but I'm telling you over the next few weeks, we're going to see a side of Jesus that's not always comfortable. And it is a side of Jesus where Jesus judges and condemns. Now, in the full context of the scripture, in talking to those who are the religious scholars, he does tell them there's a certain level of accountability that you're going to have because you know the word. And he literally is telling them, because you know better, you ought to do better. And he says, there's only but for so long that you can act this way without thinking that you will not incur the wrath or consequences of God. He says that when you know what you're supposed to do, that God looks at you in a different light. As if to suggest, I'll be more lenient with those who don't know better. But because you know my word, you have to be accountable to my word. And he literally says, that's why be careful trying to get positions and titles. Because those with positions and titles have a higher rate of condemnation if they don't manage the assignment and responsibility well. He said, I want you to understand something. God and scrutinizes you more intently because he recognizes you claim to know him best. And I hear what some of you saying, I'm with you, because you're saying, well, pastor, then why do we have grace? And I'm not saying God don't give us grace. He does. He's the God of another chance. But I would believe that many of us have done the grace what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said. We've cheapened grace. We've made grace our get out of sin free card. So when we fall short, when we know we should have done better, we throw that grace card on the table and say, God, thank you for grace. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer says that's not really how grace should be used. That it should not be something that's the, the catch-all that after we fall, we claim grace. But grace should be our motivation. That grace should be the thing that we know we have that ought to make us want to be better for God. And because you know God has given you grace, you say, Lord, since you're giving me grace, the least I can do is do my best to give you glory. Because you've given me grace, at least I can do is try my best to live how you want me to live. And I came to tell you, not just in position, but also in the church, understand with greater privilege comes greater responsibility. That we've got to get to the place where we understand that God is looking at us to be the real witnesses to the world. And he doesn't just want us to have lip service, but he wants us to have life service. And I heard it said this one way, that instead of, I, don't, I would rather see a sermon than hear a sermon. Which means that how our lives are lived is the greatest witness we can give to God. 
And as I get ready to close my little sermon today, that's all I came to tell you. That at the end of the day, you recognize because I know God and I know his word, it should have caused us to want to be better in his relationship. It ought to cause us to say, God, I need you to help me along this Christian journey. I, I need you to help me be better in every area of my life. I know that's not everybody's prayer, but that's this little preacher's prayer. Every time I wake up in the morning, I say, God, help me be better today. Help my life to be lived so that when others see me, they'll see the light of the world. And no, I'm not perfect. And no, I made some mistakes. But I thank God that God says, I trust your faithfulness because at the end of the day, your authenticity is what draws me to you because when you are authentic for God, God says, because you know who you really are, you don't take your opportunities for granted. That's why some of us have a sense of entitlement in church and you think because you saved that's all you need to do but some of us ought to say Lord I need you to be like the psalmist in my life where he said Lord create in me a clean heart and help me do your servants no harm. I need you God to order my steps in your way. That every day when I wake up before my feet hit the cold ground, I want you to make me the best that I can be. And if nobody else sees the good in me, as long as you see the good in me, I'll be fine with that. And that ought to be somebody's testimony as I prepare to close this message is that you say, Lord, I want to live a life that is so pleasing to you because I know your word. Help and make me be the best me I can be in the world. Is that your prayer today that you say, God, I don't want to be judged and condemned because I've fallen short. I want to be judged on the fact that I may not look like everybody else and I am peculiar and a chosen generation, but at the end of the day, I want a life that glorifies you. I got to leave you. May the Lord bless you real good. My voice held up a little better than I thought. But turn to somebody and say, neighbor, I came to ask you real quick because when you know who you are, when you know how God has favored you, when you know it was nobody but God that got you out of that dirt and grind, when you know it was nobody but God that uses a sinner like you, that's why you can sing that song Amazing Grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was a lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Is there anybody in here that wouldn't mind touching somebody and said, I know something about God's amazing grace. And if you want to know how amazing it is, just look at me. I came from nothing. But God still used me. I didn't have nothing. But God still used me. I don't mount to nothing. But I'm so glad that God still uses me. Is there anybody here that said, that's my testimony. That's my call to arms. Because I know who I am. And my righteousness is as filthy rags. But that's why I'm not depending on my own righteousness, but I'm depending on the righteousness of God. If that's your story today, touch that neighbor beside you and say, neighbor, I want to let you know that the only reason I can operate in this gift, the only reason that I still have the glory of God is because I'm smart enough to know that without God, I'm nothing. So you can take the collar. I want God. Take the title. I want God. Take the road. I want God. Take the house. I want God. Take the shoes. I want God. Take the committee. I want God. Take the church. I want God. Because as long as I got God, I got everything that I need. Is there anybody here that said, that's what I need? You can take the job. Give me Jesus. Take the instruments. Give me Jesus. Take everything that I need. I need. I need the Lord. Say yeah. Touch 
tell them, just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus. You can sit in the front if you want to. Just give me Jesus. You can lead the songs if you want to. Just give me Jesus. If I got Jesus. Have I said it? I'm done. Jesus. Listen, I'm done. Play softly for me. Listen. Jesus, Jesus is basically saying that those who have a selfish approach to themselves and God, there's no place for you in the kingdom. Because you're so worried about the things that you deem to be important. But we miss the most important things. Jesus says, you're making a mockery of God because you think it's about how others perceive your spiritual act. But what impresses God is when you realize that as long as he has my heart, as long as I understand who I am. See, the problem with too many of us, we're judging our spirituality on other people. And it's, a, it's an interesting to me that we'll pick people we know got certain sins we don't do. And so we'll be quick to say what we don't do. But come on, all of us know, keep calling the roll. There's going to come a moment where you're going to have to check off something you do do. That's why our exemplar, our judge, and our paradigm is not each other. You ain't trying to match my spirituality, and I ain't trying to match yours. Because we'll always find flaws and stuff in each other. Our paradigm is Christ. <laughs> And when you know he's your paradigm, you realize we all fall short. We all don't measure up to the exemplar of Jesus. See, that ought to stop a lot of what happens in church. And why the church has suffered and why the church is historically and statistically on the downward spiral. Because we so quick to talk about the sins of one another. That the truth of the matter is, Scripture says all have sinned and fallen short. And just when he said, even on your best day, your righteousness is as filthy rags. Which means on your best day, you don't measure up. So you should be just grateful and thankful that God uses you and loves you in spite of your stuff. That's why you don't have to carry yourself in a way that's haughty and stuck up. Because you realize I ain't all that. I've just been used by God. And when you understand that, that's when God gets more glory. Listen, doors of the church open. I'm done. Because at the end of the day, and we'll deal with this next week and I'll deal with this widow that gave this gift in the temple.